I'm Tony Ruiz of Gold Derby uh, here with Joshua Pearson, who is the editor of Summer of Soul, a brilliant new documentary about the Harlem Cultural Festival of 1969. And Josh, uh, one of the things that uh, when I spoke to Questlove last week, uh, he talked about feeling this, this sense of responsibility, particularly when it came to the material involved uh, in telling this story. Did you feel kind of an equal sense of responsibility with this stuff? Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I also was stunned that this concert had never been seen by the wider public in any, you know, noticeable form. It was kind of shocking to me. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan. Uh, I'm a huge history buff to begin with. I pretty much read nothing but nonfiction history books. And uh, I am in particular fascinated by the late 60s period. And in particular, you know, the, the black civil rights struggle has been a huge influence on me reading about that. There's a trilogy of books by a guy named Taylor Branch about King and the movement, the wider movement and the transition. It's so detailed and it's full of so many incredible scenes. It just, it's a stunning, stunning story that is told about the civil rights movement from about 1958 to the year King is finally killed. And I'm sorry, 58 to about 68. And uh, yeah, it's just it's so inspiring to read about the incredible <laughs> courage that, uh, you know, black people have had and continue to have struggling with this bizarro white supremacist nation that we kind of live in. <laughs> well, and one of the things that I think is so, is so kind of telling is that not, this wasn't just a one day thing that attracted you know, a few thousand people. This was a multi-week festival that attracted yeah. someone th something like 300,000 people. And yet, you know, even though it was kind of sandwiched with the moon landing and Woodstock, it still should have made some sort of waves, and and yet it it hasn't really been known about until now. Um, what was your feeling when you first started seeing this this footage? Uh, I mean, it was incredible. It was just so fresh and also kind of adorable. Like I love that the almost kind of Sesame Street background with the kind of colored shaped blocks and kind of orange and brown and green uh you know very... and just the word and just the word festival, festival yes yeah. <laughs> the word festival and these kind of cartoony letters really really cute and uh seeing everybody so young is incredible um but i want to go back to something you were saying before one of the interesting things is early on we of course, you know, we have an archival researcher who was on the team, uh, a woman named Elizabeth McGlynn. And she, uh, you know, we're like, all right, you know, number one, please find as much coverage or newspaper articles as you can about the festival, because we're going to do a little section about the festival. And uh, she couldn't find anything. She could barely find anything. And the only piece of video that she found. Uh, was that newscaster stand-up during the moon landing scene who's in the crowd and Walter Cronkite, Walter Cronkite throws to the guy and he's there in the middle of the crowd. That's the only on the ground footage that she was able to find. Like there was zero coverage. And even in newspapers, you know, she looked at the New York Times and all the other newspapers at the time Nothing. Bare, little tiny announcements in, in some of the, like the new Amsterdam news and stuff like that. But uh, very, very little, very little coverage for, yeah, for such a huge event. It's crazy. Uh, so as, as an editor, you know, take me through kind of like assembling like a, a performance section. I mean, how much, how many camera angles were you able to pull from like on a single performance? Well, that's an interesting, that's a very interesting story. So the answer is one. Really? Yes, because obviously the concert was shot with four or five cameras. Uh, but as hard as we looked through these boxes of tape, and of course the searching, the, the 
organization of the tapes took place long before I, I came on the job. Uh, you know, the producers got the boxes of tapes and they're looking through them. And we could not find any isolated cameras. We could not find any ISO reels of the individual cameras. There just were none. We found, uh, basically what we think happened is essentially they didn't have the money to keep ISO reels. So they literally just did a live line cut with a switcher that day or the whatever days the performances happened and that was it. And so all we had was the line cut to work from, as far as I know. We found like maybe two isolated camera reels out of you know dozens and dozens and dozens. So essentially I was not able to re-edit most of those main performances. I was able to sort of spice them up by obviously cheating in crowd shots from other performances and even cheating in sometimes uh, other performances by that band. Uh, you know, in particular, there's a case where uh, the Gladys Knight performance, uh, the very beginning of that song that we decided to use, Heard It Through the Grapevine, uh, you know, they clearly were having some kind of problem with the cameras. And there was just like one camera wide shot stuck on her and it was kind of bouncing up and down like this. And obviously nobody was calling shots. I don't know. I just don't I have no idea what was going on, but it was painful. And I just was thinking, I can't, we, it can't be like this. So I, I basically had to kind of build a little cheat section at the top there where there's kind of some rear angle shots uh, from other performances that they did in that same set. Uh, you know, and I had to kind of sync up the dancing so it worked and create this illusion that the, the beginning of the song was covered by multiple angles where it actually wasn't. So I was able to do certain things like that. Wow, that's that's actually kind of incredible because you don't even, I wouldn't have even noticed that unless you had said that. <laughs> yeah, I'm a cheater. I'm a big cheater. <laughs> editors, have to be, editors have to be big cheaters. They have to be excellent cheaters. <laughs> um, did, did you ever, because, you know, you, your background, especially as an editor, you've done particularly so many documentaries involving music. Um, are there are there performances that you found yourself like even really getting emotionally involved in, uh, particularly that you were like, oh, man, I really have to make sure this one stands out? For sure. I mean, I mean, I felt like they all needed to stand out quite a bit. Um, you know, I mean, one of the incredible standout performances that still kind of blows my head off is the Mavis Staples Mahalia Jackson duet. But again, I actually didn't touch that because I couldn't because we didn't have any ISO angles. So uh, that is as it was done on the line cut live that day. Uh, so, you know, in that case, it's just, the work went into trying to make sure it was set up properly and then, and then come out of properly. And so the setup of course is, you know, that incredibly moving story from present day Jesse Jackson and Jesse Jackson in 69, kind of duetting with himself, telling the story <laughs> about he was walking with Ben Branch and, uh, you know, and then I had to mix Mavis Staples in there talking about how it was her, she was so blown away to be working with Mahalia. So, you know, I tried to kind of just set it up well and then kind of come out of it as well. Luckily, there was a long kind of instrumental, almost ambient jam they did before the singer started, which I was able to use essentially as a bed for that whole Jesse Jackson exp expository storytelling about the killing of King. Um, yeah, so that was that. Uh, and and of course the, the the film ends with that you know amazing you know few a couple of performances by Nina Simone and of course you yeah. edited that yeah. amazing documentary about her. Um, was it was it interesting to to revisit Nina in like a different setting than the previous experience? It was absolutely. I mean, we actually used so you know, 
the footage has some of the footage has leaked out over the years. I mean, if you search for it on YouTube, there have been leaks, and Nino was one of those leaks. And when we were doing what happened to Simone with Liz Garbus, you know, we found uh, some of that some of those performances from that day on YouTube, and we're like, oh, we have to get this. And in that film, we used her reading of the poem. Um, but we used a much shorter version of it. Uh, and then um, for this film, I was definitely way more into letting her talk with her in-between song banter. So you didn't get a huge amount of that in the other film, but I thought it was nice to let her kind of say her thing because you get so much flavor of her, even when, you know, I love the moment where she is about to, she's going into uh, Young, Gifted and Black and she says, uh, you know, you've all heard of a play called Young uh, Raising of the Sun by Lorraine Hansberry. And you hear a couple of kind of weak little like, yeah, from the crowd. And then she goes, huh? And everybody, you know, what was that? And they were like, yeah. You know, she just has this stern <laughs> command of the audience. And she's like, come on, people. Uh, so it's fun to let her speak a little. And then, of course, she prefaces the poem with uh, the fact that it's not her words. She's actually reading a poem by another guy. It was just nice to let her talk from the stage a little bit more. Yeah, and yet deliver it in quintessential Nina Simone-ness. Yeah, this kind of imperial, very haughty, stern kind of way, queenly. Um, you know, working with Questlove, I want to know about, you know, kind of your collaboration with him, especially, you know, this was his first foray into directing. Yeah. Um, and you know, telling a story this this complex with this many layers is challenging for any director. And so what was your experience working with, with Questlove as a first time director? Well, he got it immediately. I mean, he did know, he, you know, of course had a song list of his favorite tracks. Uh, you know, I didn't have to watch all the footage because he had already been obsessively watching it. I'm sure he told you how he had it on loop constantly. And uh, so he had very strong ideas about certain songs that he wanted to highlight. And uh, he had very strong structural ideas, big picture structural ideas. You know, he wanted for sure to open with the Stevie Wonder drum solo, uh, wanted to end with higher, uh, and, uh, you know, all, uh, definitely wanted the Mahavis Samalia duet to be this kind of big peak in the film. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, I just tried to be, it was very good for me to be working for a director who also was a musician and a DJ, because I actually myself make electronic music on the side. And I used to make, ele I've made electronic music for the last 30 years. And uh, I, in fact, was in a strange kind of art band called Emergency Broadcast Network. And we did this kind of rhythmic cutting. We made these music videos that were like montages of found footage that we recorded from TV set to hip hop beats that I would make. Uh, and I developed a kind of video sampler style back in the nineties that has kind of had to lay dormant for the last 30 years and this really was the perfect job because I knew that Questlove would appreciate a kind of slightly more VJ style of editing, but it only in spots, you know, we're not talking about a massive kind of VJ cut all the way through a two hour movie. Um, well, what, what I find so interesting, you know, in looking at your career is you've worked in so many different departments. You've worked in, in sound and music and all that kind of stuff. And, yeah. and music has certainly been kind of a through line in many of your Oh, of your projects, um, um, totally. I'm thinking. I'm thinking specifically of the, the 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 Paul Simon Under African Skies documentary that is yeah. one of my absolute favorites. Yeah. Um, and so, what what is it that draws you to specific projects? What is there something that happens that when you're pre presented with a project that you're like, yes, absolutely, totally. I mean, actually, again, this was sort of a dream project in that. I love music and I love history. And so this also, I mean, you know, with Under African Skies, Paul Simon's Graceland Journey, that film, 
I was able to do a little deep dive, deep-ish dive into the whole apartheid situation that was happening, which has always fascinated me, you know, and I've read books about it and I've cut another thing a long time ago that involved a lot of archival footage of apartheid. And of course, we, we, I lived through the whole um, boycott situation in the 80s and 90s. And uh, uh, so that was fascinating. And uh, I love, I love history and I love learning new things while working on a job. And you know, this it's interesting because the working title of uh, this film, I think for a while was 1969, when it was kind of still kind of secret or whatever. And I had just a couple of years ago edited a four part uh, doc series for Netflix for Don Porter called uh, Bobby Kennedy for President, which was an archival history, 60s history dream come true. And that went, was like basically a bio, cradle to grave biography of Robert Kennedy, which ends of course in the year 1968. And so then when this film came along, I'm like, oh cool, I'm progressing through history. So I hit, finished off at 68, now I'm picking it up at 69. So I hope whatever I do next will be set in the year 1970. <laughs> but there's some, there's something about the 60s archival footage that I just love because they were still shooting on film a lot of the time. So you still get these gorgeous film, grainy film footage and color kicks in. You know, the Bobby Kennedy doc is interesting because there's so much black and white for the first half. And then the second half, suddenly things are in color and uh, it's just great. I just love it. I mean, all the 60, all the hippie stuff and Woodstock and, you know, and Vietnam. I mean, it's always tempting to do like, all right, we're going to do a Vietnam scene with napalm. And, you know, I get excited about that stuff. <laughs> Hell, I think you could do a documentary easily on just, you know, Tony Lawrence's outfits. I mean, you know, <laughs> I mean, I, I want to know more about him. Um, um, just, just to kind of wrap up, you know, this film has been so well received and it's, you know, really seems to have uh, struck a chord. Um, uh, why, why do you think that is? What is it about this film that you think is, is, is resonating so much? Well, I mean, we start, when we started out, I think it was going to be a little bit more of a music film, a musicological film, uh, you know, which of course is what Questlove loves. He loves the study of music and he's written all these books, including the one that just came out. And uh, so, and then the pandemic happened. So we worked for a couple months pre-pandemic, you know, and then lockdown happened and then George Floyd summer happened. And it just seemed like the world had gone completely insane. And it was super resonant with what was happening in 69. We, we always intended on including some political stuff around the edges of songs, but it, you know, we definitely amped it up a little more as a result and, uh, you know, got some interview subjects who were there in Harlem in 69, who were the activist Denise Oliver Velez, and we have Bullwhip, uh, Cyril Bullwhip Innes, the Black Panther who was doing security that day. Um, so, you know, we, and it just felt like a really interesting combination of a very, we knew we were making a very joyful film because there was such great music in it. And we knew that makes people happy. And yet, you know, and so by injecting the political stuff into that, we didn't want it to be like a huge downer. <laughs> so even when it's a dark, political archival moment happening, it's still kind of executed in a playful way. So that you're getting this funny mix of joy and pain. And I love that Questlove makes the point a lot that he wanted this film to show more black joy and less black pain. And I think we accomplished that, you know, I mean, you can't deny the pain that's happened and continues to happen. So it's in there. But overall, it felt like, felt like a movie that America needed coming out of lockdown George Floyd summer. It just was like, it's joyful. And yet it's also 
you're seeing resonance with the political stuff that's happening now. And, uh, you know, it, it just seemed to be the perfect film at the perfect time. It definitely is. Um, uh, everybody go to goldderby.com, make your predictions for the Oscars, the Emmys, Golden Globes, and uh, stay tuned for more interviews with contenders throughout the season. Uh, Josh Pearson, thank you very much. A great pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Thanks a lot. Thank you.